Good morning or good afternoon, or good evening, depends on where you are. Uh, my name is Helen He. I'm of the NERSC user training. And welcome to the OpenMP training session, training series session seven, the last session today. Um, so we highly appreciate uh, our speakers, Christian and Michael, for staying with us for the last six months. Appreciate your effort, commitment, and contribution and with expertise. Um, just briefly, uh, today's session seven, we're picking up miscellaneous topics, some things we didn't have time for, or some additional topics that uh, people think are, are interesting. So today's mis uh, miscellaneous topics, we have had six sessions previously. Everything can be found on our web page, uh, slides, exercise, recordings of previous sessions, link to those. And then there's also a GitHub repo for exercises and slides. Here, um, I will just display the slide for a minute or so because uh, most of you have seen it. If you haven't, the truly expertise, like I said, and I highly appreciate. Um, we, we definitely learn a lot from all the way, all the full scope of OpenMP from introductions, uh, CPUs and um, GPUs and hybrid. So yeah, thank you again. Probably less than a minute, but I'll go on. Uh, logistics, everyone is, um, is muted, but if you want to ask any questions, feel free to. And uh, if you don't want to be recorded, uh, create, you can type your questions in the Slack channel. We will read it for you. Um, I'll put the link to Slack channel again in case you haven't joined. Um, we have, uh, Also, there's a survey, so I'll post the survey um, at the end as well. And everything is, um, we have closed captioning, you can turn on and uh, we can also view the full transcript as, as you wish and even save it. So with that, I'm gonna pass on to Christian. I think you'll start next. Yes, set the plan. Okay. Oops. <clears throat> Just one second of working with PowerPoint, sorry for that. <clears throat> I was going to say, let's give you a round of applause virtually. So I'm going to start mine. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Then uh, that react thing. Yeah. Kind of good morning to the US uh, and good evening to Europe. This is the uh, oops. This is the agenda for today. So we will um, again ask for your question on the previous session. Um, I will uh, uh, add two remarks on the homework assignment. So I know last week I promised to bring performance numbers, not last week, but uh, last time we met. But my last week was really uh, different than uh, what I planned. So I don't have those numbers. But if you're interested in performance results on Hopper system, send me an email. Yeah? You will find my email address if you Google. Then Michael will take over and uh, complete our introduction of Cindy programming in OpenMP. Uh, I will continue with um, um, task affinity. So we talked about tasking uh, two or three months ago, I guess. And uh, there's one remark. Yeah? So combining NUMA and tasking is possible with uh, task affinity. Then we will switch back to Michael talking on real world application um, optimization work in particular for GPUs, NW chemistry application on which you will present results. And I will close this on the topic of hybrid programming, just I think four or five slides on MPI plus OpenMP, a few things that have to be kept in mind when combining those two parallel programming models. And I believe this has been a request from the audience. So remember, we invited you in the very beginning to let us know what you're interested in. So while I switch the slide decks, this is your chance to come up with another few questions on uh, session six. Are there any questions? Or any comments you want to make? Um, feel free to. Okay. So there's something in the chat, something happened. 
Oh, no, that's the Slack channel. Okay. So I believe uh, Michael or Helen, you are monitoring the Slack. If there's yes, any questions, will. otherwise I continue. So remember, why is it not advancing? That we uh, distributed Jacobi um, as the uh, application to play with in terms of GPU. So it's a little bit uh, different from uh, what other courses use, maybe, yeah, maybe not. And I already presented the basic approach yeah, that was just uh, putting a single loop into the, or making one single loop, yeah, this one here uh, representing the kernel to be offloaded. We improved that with a target region. Yeah, let me go to the laser pointer here that starts here and um, runs until, yeah, the contains, sorry, the whole while loop. Yeah, and then we have two for loops which are both offloaded and uh, we can keep data in between on the device. Yeah, that's the goal of the target region. And uh, last time we also talked about unstructured data movement. So this is what you see here. What we can do is um, to take a look at the uh, main routine, for example, call a routine or call something like initialize, call it next, swap and deallocate. Uh, which is maybe a little bit more structural pattern yeah, considered to be good. Uh, programming in general uh, to encapsulate functionality if we want that. And I think last time I motivated this with C and C++ routines. We need a data region, a C and C++ constructor, sorry. We need a data region that spends a lifetime um, or the dynamic extent in which these multiple functions are being called. And if we then have a routine like initialize, for example, yeah, we can make use of uh, the unstructured data movement. This is target enter data. That means in here, yeah, we map the arrays A and A new from the host to the device and they uh, end up in the existing data region. Then we have other functions yeah, like calcnex uh, in which we have a target region yeah, doing the teams distribute parallel four. That means uh, executing a parallel curler, kernel on the device. And we have arrays like A already on the device. And we can call multiple of those like in an iterated manner and keep them on the device and update it. And uh, finally, yeah, swap is uh, an encapsulation of copying the old solution into the new solution or the other way around, depending on how you see it in the simple numerical approach. And finally, we have a cleanup function yeah, uh, in, in C++ that could be the destructor. We have the OMP exit data with maps A and A new as a result from the device to the host. However, here the only routine or the only thing that's done with the data is to actually free it. Yeah? Not really a reasonable uh, use case, but I hope this illustrates uh, the usage pattern. So again, the invite, if you need performance numbers on a reasonable machine, yeah, I can probably do some measurements next week. Sorry for not bringing them with me. So the slide deck still contains uh, the old, uh, the really old measurements on a um, uh, V100. That was the Volta architecture. Yeah? Hard to remember uh, these days. Any questions on the homeworks? This is how we call it. That's probably not the case. No question Maybe. on Slack or chat so far. Michael, I hand over to you. All right. Let me get this going. Screen share. All right. So um, I owe folks still um, the remaining half of the Cindy presentation. So um, thanks for being here. Um, and um, I'll start with a short recap of some three slides to set the stage again about what um, we're talking about. So the first thing, um, looking at x86 architectures, uh, there's the SSE instruction set, there's AVX, there's AVX 512. So there are instructions in the instruction set that process multiple data within within a single instruction invocation, and that's why it's single instruction multiple data 
or SIMD for short. And in the previous part, I was uh, motivating, you know, what the instructions can do, um, and that it's sometimes a little hard for the compiler to actually create uh, the proper instruction sequence out of the code that you're writing, and you've seen a bunch of cases. Um, and the difficulty for the compiler is that usually you would not do the vectorization yourself. You basically just write your code, and then you turn on your compiler optimization levels that you that you desire, and then some sort of auto vectorization would kick in, and um, basically look at the loops that you wrote. And then um, as part of the general loop optimization passes, would go through those loops and try to vectorize them. And the way this usually works is that the, the code has to first be analyzed so that the compiler tries to understand or eventually understands a bit better what you actually me meant when you wrote your C, C++ or Fortran code. And you know some of the syntax and semantic restrictions that C, C++ have basically um, do not provide the enough information to the compiler to have the context knowledge about whether things are uh, paralyzable or not. And so we have to, in the compiler, do the code analysis and basically um, try to figure out if what you wrote is actually something that we can paralyze in case with, in this case, with SIMD instructions. So. If we, if we understand that enough so that we know that there is nothing in the code that would harm SIMD vectorization, then the compiler will apply some heuristics to basically figure out, will it be actually beneficial if we run this using SIMD instructions, or would you rather get lower performance? And again, this is you know like um, more like a guesstimate by the compiler, because again, we don't know uh, the full structure of your code. We don't know the full size of your input data. We don't know the dynamic state of the system. So we basically have to strive in the compiler to determine that um, as well as we can make and produce a, 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 a as good estimate as we can as we can get to. And then if all those things go well, so the code analysis says yes, we can vectorize, and the heuristics say yes, this is going to be likely benefit performance, then the compiler will generate SIMD instructions. And I think I mentioned that when I presented the slide the first time, uh, this is where the laser pointer is right now. That's actually the easy part. So once the compiler knows how the code looks like, generating SIMD instructions is actually a piece of cake. Um, the hard part is the code analysis. So trying to make uh, to understand the semantics of the code that you wrote. Um, and then sometimes it's also hard to come up with good heuristics um, that cover like a whole variety of different uh, loop styles, um, domains um, that the code is coming from, like HPC machine learning, uh, web servers, uh, editors, whatnot. Um, so having a good span in the heuristics is, is actually rather difficult and is probably for considered black magic by some some of our users. Um, three examples, so Clang-based compiler, um, like the AMD ones, for instance, or of course the uh, original LLVM project Clang compiler, there's F vectorize, and then dash R pass equals loop, and then um, a regular expression dot star for you know uh, arbitrary character sequences. That is, uh, the first option is turning on loop vectorizations. The second one turns on the reporting feature so that the compiler will actually tell you whether or not it vectorized the loop. And that's very important information going forward, even with my slide deck, so that you know if the auto vectorizer kicks in, you don't have to do the manual work yourself by adding the open and PCMD directives. Just rely on what the compiler is doing. And only in those cases where you think that the compiler should be overruled in its decision to not vectorize, you would add the open and PCMD directives. And then with M prefer vector width, you can choose the preferred vector width. So on the previous slide, I was showing like SSE with 128 bits, AVX with 256 bits, and then AVX 512 with, with AVX 5, uh, 512 bits. Um, so here you can you know um, pick the preferred vector width um, that you want the compiler to use uh, for your code. If you prefer GCC, pretty much similar. There's F3 vectorize and F3 loop vectorize, and then you know these turn on vectorizations, 
Um, and then there's f opt in for vec all, which basically tells the compiler to tell you about the, the loop optimizations it did in terms of vectorization. And then with the Intel compiler, there's dash vec, um, which is automatically enabled with uh, optimization level 02 and higher. And then there's q opt report equals vec. Same thing, the compiler will tell you whether it vectorized something. And if it did not vectorize it, it will tell you the reasons why it did not. All right, so um, we talked about this before. Um, so in a time before opening P40, this is how the situation typically looked like. So either you had to go to a different program model like Intel Silk Plus, um, which is unfortunately not longer available. It was a pretty interesting programming model. Uh, you would have to go to co compiler pragmas like pragma vector, or even in the worst case, go to low level constructs like uh, x86 intrinsics to in, in issue um, a add instruction on packed double precision data um, elements, and which then corresponds to one of the addition uh, instructions in the in the ISA. Uh, Fortran is a bit better though. Um, so in the programming model of Fortran, if you're a Fortran programmer, you will know that there's array notations. So you can have in your um, assignment statement um, some sort of do this for the whole array kind of syntax. And so some of the semantic gaps that I was mentioning earlier are then resolved by um, switching to um, Fortran array notations because then the compiler has proper semantics and know how the elements are supposed to be processed. But, you know, eventually you ended up with like a pragma sequence like this. So you pick pragma omp parallel four to basically say, you know, parallelize this loop over uh, the available threads. And then vector always if you're an Intel GCC sort of person. Uh, and then pragma ivdep also if you're a GCC person to basically say always vectorize, overrule the heuristics. Um, and there are no aliases. And you know, there. If you assume that there are data dependencies, just ignore those assumptions. Uh, it's safe to vectorize. And then you have to trust your compiler to do the actual right thing, um, which sometimes is not really the case. And you know, because you're touching two two different parts of the compiler: first the open and p pass, and then the vectorizer pass. And so you know, um, sometimes the interaction between those two passes were not so easy because these were two let's say programming worlds colliding in, in one code. And even worse, uh, if you had um, support for different compilers, you probably would have like, you know, a whole sequence of those um, guarded by compilation guards saying, you know, if it's the Intel compiler, use that set of directives. If it's the Cray compiler, use that set of directives. If it's GCC, use that and, and so forth, right? So complicated world and um, in, in the OpenMP ARB, we felt for, that there is a certain desire in the community um, to get rid of this problem and standardize that as it is the OpenMP's ARB mission. Okay, so this is the syntax. Again, we're going to skip over those slides mostly, and I'm, 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 I'm going to show you mostly stuff with uh, by example. So here's an example, just you know, like a scalar product. You take two vectors. Uh, you multiply them, you sum them up. And so, you know, with the SIMD directive, you can vectorize this loop. Um, and you can also express to the compiler that it would re sort of rearrange the operations on the sum variable so that we can actually vectorize that and then in the end take a horizontal sum um, across the sum vector and uh, sum up the four or eight uh, vector elements and produce the final, the final sum. Uh, please note that this is uh, running sequentially. It will use SIMD instructions, so it will be SIMD parallel, but it will not be thread parallel. We'll get to that um, a bit later. Data sharing classes. Um, if you um, went through the all, all of the series, you're very familiar with those, but I'm going to slightly reinterpret their meaning in terms of SIMD. So, for instance, where we said a private clause with a variable list uh, produces an uninitialized copy per thread, we now have an uninitialized copy of that variable per SIMD lane or per vector element. Okay, so the original X variable becomes an uninitialized list of X0, X1, X2, X3, and so forth, one per um, vector lane. 
The same for first private, just now with uh, moving the value or copying the value from the original variable into the vector. So here we basically take the original value 42 and we're gonna broadcast that into the private copies in each vector lane um, and initialize each vector lane to that, var uh, to that same value. Reduction, um, in uh, the threading world, we, we said that each thread receives a private variable. And in the end, there's a global operation to basically reduce all those thread private copies. And here it's pretty similar. So there's an initialized copy. The original value is going to be dependent on the operation that you choose. You, you uh, please refer back to the threading part. And then we will have a private variable per, per SIMD lane. And then in the end, we're going to do a horizontal aggregation across that SIMD vector, applying that operation, producing the original result. That is now going to be a scalar, and we're going to assign that scalar to the original variable x. So pretty consistent with what you know from threading, but just now on the level of SIMD registers. Then there's SafeLen. Um, this is now a, a rather long back reference to the first part of the SIMD session. Um, there was an example where I had a loop on a slide where there was a, this, a loop that carried dependence between two uh, loop iterations, and that distance between the two iterations was 17. Um, and so to, to tell the compiler about this sort of dependence, um, you can use the safe len clause. And now the compiler knows that there's a data dependency of length 17 across 17 loop iterations. And then it can pick any vector length up to 17 minus one effectively um, to basically um, vectorize the loop without breaking um, the loop care dependence. So that's this kind of additional context information that you as the programmer can give after you have analyzed all your loop care dependencies. Then there is linear. Uh, linear allows you to express for a certain variable x at iteration i the value that x will assume during the computation. And usually how this works is that you know the original x variable is incremented in each loop iteration step. Um, and so after like i iterations with the loop invariant linear step, you can pre-compute at any iteration the value using the original variable plus you know, the loop iteration variable and the step size for that variable. So this is, you know, if you iterate through data structures using pointers, or if you have other linear dependencies on, on induction variables, uh, you can use the linear clause to tell the compiler about those dependencies um, and help it to resolve it if you have this sort of closed form um, to compute um, the value of the variable each, at each iteration. And then there is aligned. Uh, this is not for correctness. This is more for performance. So you can tell that a certain list item, like a pointer, has a certain alignment. So you use uh, things like POSIX memaline to, uh, to get that memory. Or you used one of the OpenMP memory allocators that also uh, provide mechanisms to get properly aligned data. Um, and now with the align clause, you can tell the compiler about this uh, about those alignment properties and so in that case the compiler can if the architecture so re requires uh, produce better code um, and select different instructions if there is like you know a faster aligned load versus a slower unaligned load and then there's collapse uh, you know about this so you can collapse multiple loop nests into a single um, wider or longer loop so that um, you have more um, data that you can process in SIMD instructions. Okay, the SIMD work sharing inst um, construct. So same example again, but now I want to also parallelize. So the first thing I'm going to highlight is Pragma on four. That's the multi-threading um, part. So this aspect of the directive will basically parallelize the loop iteration space into the, into in this case, three chunks for each of the three threads that I'm um, showing on this slide. And then the second step is that the SIMD part of the directive is, is applied. And then each of the loop chunks is being vectorized and cut into smaller chunks that are then assigned to SIMD instructions and SIMD registers.
Um, what I also did on the slide is there is like a um, light gray and dark gray part. So what the compiler does for you is because in general, the chunk size is not that is assigned to a thread is not a multiple of the vector length. That's not always the case or actually seldomly the case. Um, the compiler automatically creates a remainder loop for the first chunk to basically um, run those three iterations at the end of the chunk and have a special treatment for those. Then for the second chunk of the, of the second thread, it basically has a peel loop that peels off the first iteration. So then uh, we can restart computation on full vector registers. Then there's a remainder loop again. And then for the final chunk, it has a peel loop again that peels off the first couple of iterations until we hit a, a vector boundary again. And then we switch to vectorized execution. Of course, if those remainder loops are, or P loops are not needed and the chunk size is a multiple of the SIMD size um, and the compiler is able to prove that, then um, it's not gonna do those uh, loops and can kick them out. But in general, those loops will be there. Okay, especially those loops will be there if you ask for something that you're not supposed to ask for. So let's suppose you do something like this. Right, so you have Pragma on four with the SIMD um, directive. And then uh, you heard about the schedule clause and now you apply the schedule clause asking for a static scheduling with chunk size of five. Now five is a really bad number when it comes to vectorization because most of the vector architectures that I know of have multiples of four or are multiples of two or powers of two like two, four, eight, 16, uh, and, and potentially 32 and 64. Um, so five is like certainly bad. So if you run this example, say on an AVX2 machine, um, the code will only execute the remainder loop. So this is data type float. That means eight float elements per vector. So five is certainly less than eight. So that means we don't have a full vector to pack and run. Um, and we can only run in the remainder loop. If I go back to that one, basically those vectors down here, they don't exist. Um, and we would be only be running in this uh, remainder loop. So that is that is going to give you bad performance. And most certainly it will not give you SIMD instructions. And for SSE, what will happen is, so in an SSE register, we have four float elements. So in this case, the code will run, have one iteration using SIMD registers and then one iteration in the remainder loop, which is also kind of uh, not ideal in terms of performance. The way to fix this is um, a modifier that we introduced with OpenMP 4.5, where you can write SIMD colon static. So basically you ask the compiler to uh, come up with a static schedule that roughly has chunk size five but that is amenable or change the five to be something that is useful for SIMD. So what, ha what would happen in this case for SSE and AVX instructions, the eight would be changed by the compiler to eight because for AVX, that is the smallest vector size for the data type. And for SSE, it would also be changed to eight um, because that's the first multiple of a vector size that fits um, full SIMD vector registers. All right, and then SIMD function vectorization. Let's say we have something like this. So here, down here, we are processing, you know, um, some arrays. Uh, the first thing that I that I want to do here is compute something, the you know, roughly in something like a Euclidean ex uh, distance, except that I don't take the square root. Um, so we compute the di the the distance between a of i and b of i, and then we want to take this. Um, and see if it's the minimum between you know, the distance and some C array, and that is going to be the distance array D. And we're gonna do this for like you know, a bunch of elements. And suppose I wanna do it like um, in a multi-threaded setting, including SIMD instructions. And here I'm actually showing also that there's a version parallel for SIMD. Um, so you can also launch the parallel team um, for multi-threading and then assign SIMD um, work to it, to those to those te uh, teams. Um, now the compiler has a bunch of options to, to do this. 
if it sees everything up here, it can pretty much inline everything into the into the loop and then vectorize. Um, or it could just say, you know, um, I'm not going to vectorize this at all. Uh, I'm going to just fall back to SIMD length one. Or it could basically, you know, if, if SIMD length is eight, just have this like eight times in a row, um, have scalar invocations of this of these functions eight times after each other. Um, before that, it unpacks the vectors into scalars. And after the sequence of function call, it repacks um, a SIMD vector, all of which are not ideal, um, especially when those um, functions are coming from outside from an outside translation unit like a library. Now for MIM, um, most recent compilers actually have vector versions of that. They have a vector math library that has min, max, sine, cosine, uh, tangents, exponential square roots, reciprocal square roots, pretty much everything that you know from uh, the math header um, in the C library. Um, reasonable compilers usually um, have a library to support SIMD vectorizations for those standardized math operations. But this SQ certainly is a function that is not uh, in any math library. That's uh, something I wrote. So we have to deal with this. Um, OpenMP actually has a way to do this. So you can prefix um, a function with declare SIMD. And I'm going to show you how that works. So in this case, we just prefix this SQ and min um, with declare SIMD. And what the compiler now does for you, and this is actual assembler code spit out, I believe, by the Clang compiler. So basically, the input variables or input parameters A and B become vector registers. So those original scalar values are being promoted to vectors. And also the return type becomes a vector register, even though it's not really visible. Uh, you have to look at the Linux um, SIMD ABI to basically know that setmm0 by default is uh, the return value. And so the red instruction will return in quotation marks a setmm0 register to the caller. And that's also a vector register, of course. And now that a, b, and the return value are actual vectors, um, we can use a vector operation, like in this case, v min ps, to compare a and b and return the proper value into setmm0 and then return. For disk sq, we're going to do roughly the same. So x and y become vector registers, again, setmm0 and setmm1. The return value becomes a vector. And then we can use the vectorized sub instruction and the vectorized mul instructions to basically implement this for eight x's and eight y's in, in one go. And then down here, we basically call um, the corresponding vector operations. And now the compiler can uh, fully vectorize that code because it can use those instructions um, and those functions. Uh, one thing I'm going to say now, uh, now is that uh, you, know, you see this kind of strange, uh, wow, letters and numbers code in front of the function. So there's some name mangling going on because you can have multiple of those versions. The compiler, if you have one declare SIMD, will generate two versions of that function, one scalar function that you can call like usual, and then the SIMD function um, that you can call from the SIMD context. And you can have multiple of those declare SIMDs in front of a in front of a function so that you can generate multiple different versions of the same function for different context uh, in which you want to call those functions. Um, the declare SIMD uh, takes um, a bunch of clauses. So SIMD length, so you can explicitly pick a SIMD length. So you can have a version of the function for SSE, for AVX, and for AVX 512, or any other um, combination of those. We can have um, a uniform clause to basically describe to the compiler that a certain argument should not be promoted to a vector register. It will still internally be used as the vector register, but basically you in the function calling sequ uh, um, you will basically give a single scalar variable as an input, and then the function will basically broadcast that into a vector register so that similar to first private, um, the scalar is used like as many times as you need 
uh, for your Symbian structures. In branch and not in branch, I'm going to explain separately. And then there's linear and aligned. Uh, you know that from the loops already. OK, in branch and not in branch. So suppose we have a code like this where we want to run a Symd loop that has an if statement inside the loop body. So we only want to execute do stuff if a of i is actually less than zero. So that doesn't really work with Symd because you know we basically can run a full Symd instruction or we can execute no Symd instruction. But if you remember the first part of the Symd session, you will probably remember that we had mask instructions. And so what we can do is we can basically have a implicit argument with a mask register. We can say that the vmol instructions, so the vector multiplication that we need to execute this statement down here, should only effect, have an effect where the mask register has a true value, and it should not have an effect where the mask where the mask register has a false value. So we now can describe that the vmul pd, the multiplication instruction, should not have an effect on all the data elements, but eventually only on a subset of the elements. And now down here, what we can do is we can use a v compare instruction, so a vector compare, which takes a full vector of a's or a vector or a elements, compares them with zero, and produces a mask register where um, which then has a true value where a was less than zero and will have a false value where a was, a was not less than zero. And now if we pass the mask register into that function, we sort of push the evaluation or the effect of the if statement that was selecting whether we do stuff or not. We now push the decision into the function and make sure that the function is called for all, for a full vector, but it will only have an effect and act as if it was contained in an if statement um, that follows those principles. So this is in branch. Basically, in branch means um, the compiler will add that mask register and have the corresponding evaluation and augment all the code so that it basically will adhere to this kind of mask register. And not in branch is the exact opposite, basically tell the compiler that it shouldn't add the, this implicit um, mask register at all. Does it pay off? So this is a bit dated. It's uh, more, than more than a decade ago we did this. Uh, and it's in, in OpenMP for a long time. And most certainly the picture has slightly changed because all the compilers have been developing over time and became <clears throat> much more aggressive in how they can exploit SIMD instructions. Um, so, but regardless, you know, from that generation, the blue part is one compiler um, normalized to one performance. Um, and then, you know, the red bar shows the speed up that we attained by using OpenMP SIMD directives or a precursor of those. Um, and as you can see, you know, there's some nice speed ups and we were even able for Mundle Pro to, vec to vectorize something like a while loop uh, using function vectorization um, where a regular compiler probably still today um, will not vectorize a code um, of that structure. All right, with that, I'm pretty much done. Um, and Christian can, can get set up and I'll go through questions. I've seen the chat popping up a but bunch of there are, times. There are no questions in the chat. These are okay. just information. All right. Me. Thank Maybe you. Maybe on Slack. Uh, no, no questions on Slack. But if you have questions, feel free to type them in while Christian is talking, and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you. Excellent, Mike. OK. So this is called the MISC session. Yeah, miscellaneous, hard to pronounce as a German, or at least for me. And uh, that means we're jumping a little bit back and forth, but we wanted to catch up um, on some uh, things that you leave out, yeah, or to add a few things to really, um, yeah, highlight all those dark corners when connecting uh, some of the concepts that we explained before. And this is about it. So uh, let's go back to the topic on NUMA non-uniform memory access architectures. And I'm pretty sure, sure I stated NUMA is uh, going to affect 
or is, is a present, sorry, on every modern system because you have more than a single memory controller per socket. In HPC, you typically have two or more sockets per system or two or more kinds of memory. So that means we have to deal with what we call affinity optimization. We want to have uh, the data that's used heavily by an individual core or execution unit as close as possible to that in order to get higher bandwidth and lower latency. Yeah. Now, uh, we, uh, in this uh, particular chapter, we learned how to bind the threads, how to allocate data in parallel and so forth. And um, uh, in the next chapter, or maybe even the one before, I don't remember, sorry, we learned about tasking, which means let the OpenMP runtime decide which thread is going to execute which task at what point in time and so forth. So this sounds as if we have two very competing concepts here, either a full control to optimize for memory affinity or data affinity, or, and the other one is uh, to leave the execution decisions up to the runtime. Now with OpenMP, uh, when we did we introduce it, Michael, with OpenMP 5 maybe, uh, or four or five, um, we got some mechanisms to actually still yeah, leave those decisions to the runtime where to execute the task, but we can provide some additional information that this runtime may or may not be, but hopefully will respect in its decision, yeah, in scheduling decisions. And this is about improving the performance of task parallel programs, in particular on NUMA systems by means of task affinity. So I already uh, said that, yeah, let's remember what we did. We talked about OpenMP places. OMP places is a corresponding environment variable. We see uh, underscore in between that basically define the level of abstraction at which we want to perform thread binding. Yeah, at least this is how I typically introduce this feature and OMP underscore proc underscore bind or the proc underscore bind clauses on a parallel region, for example, uh, that can influence then how the OpenMP threads will be bound to the OpenMP places. Yeah? So eventually threads are being bound to cores or a set of cores, but places, as I said, is the level of abstraction at which we want to perform binding, like sockets, last uh, level caches, NUMA nodes, uh, logical cores and so forth. These are the OpenMP mechanisms, or you can make use of um, operating system, meaning Linux functionality like task set dash C with a set of cores to which then an OpenMP program or a parallel program in general is being uh, restricted in the execution. Now remember tasking. So tasks may in general be Ex, uh, executed by any thread in the team, which is good because we argued about load balancing. So threads um, sitting on a core and being idle will take a look at what we introduced as a task pool and then steal task or grab tasks that are ready for execution and hence contribute to the progress of the program. However, if we have multiple threads and multiple tasks available, yeah, they are better and worse uh, steal, stealing or let's say mapping decisions. And uh, this is what we want to achieve here. We want to hint the runtime how to select tasks. Yeah? And this is what the affinity clause, thanks for my slides, they provide this uh, hint here uh, that have been introduced with OpenMP5. So we can uh, express the uh, desired affinity of um, uh, OpenMP tasks to data. So it's a new clause, or with OpenMP5, it was a new clause that is added to the Pragma OP task construct that you already know of, and it contains a list of variables. Typically, it's on, or in all use cases that I've seen so far, it makes sense to restrict uh, the application to only a single uh, use case. And that means it provides a hint to the runtime, uh, really a hint to execute this particular task as closely as possible to the physical location of the data yeah, that's provided in here. That means the variable. And uh, we also talked about dependencies. And I think I emphasized that this is a hint a couple of times. You have to understand the difference. A dependency means a task can only be, or dependencies 
if specified mean a task can only be executed when all its dependencies have been fulfilled, whereas an affinity is a hint to the runtime which it may just ignore because not it doesn't implement it or because it believes it knows better. Yeah? But it may also follow your advice and um, uh, which hopefully then leads to better performance. The goal is not to ensure that things happen at a certain place, but instead um, provide again a uh, path to optimization to improve data locality, uh, for example, by re uh, reducing the remote memory accesses, that means accesses to data that are uh, that is further apart than necessary. And I believe that's also important, decrease the runtime variability because the execution um, pass of the set of tasks in an OpenMP program becomes more predictable or meaning more uh, similar over multiple runs. However, yeah, in the future, there will be even more concepts uh, to actually uh, achieve that. So why is it only a hint? Yeah, Because task stealing is still allowed. That means the runtime can override your decision or your proposal and uh, that even makes sense yeah? if, for example, a set of threads is underutilized because it doesn't have any data to execute. And then the uh, heuristic of the runtime is to better utilize those threads than to keep them uh, or leave them idle uh, while waiting for other threads that are closer to the data. And at the end of the day, that's the idea of a shared memory system or the optimization for that, minimize remote memory access or maximize data locality, but uh, utilize all cores in the full memory subsystem. So this is a, a code example, and uh, it doesn't make sense to make use of the stream benchmark, which is a memory bandwidth benchmarks with OpenMP tasks. Uh, we just selected uh, this example to illustrate that uh, we can get as close as possible, or very close, sorry, to the actual performance of the work sharing variant. But let me explain what's happening here. So we have an iteration starting from an index uh, running for a couple of iterations where we say A of I equals B of I plus scalar times C. If A, B and C are large enough and if we know the size and measure the runtime, we can actually compute the memory bandwidth huh? because B and C have to be loaded and uh, A has to be written. Yeah? So we know that this amount of data is being streamed uh, from the memory to the CPU and back. So if we do that in tasks yeah, with uh, this number of iterations or the difference between those indexes, sorry, as number of iterations per task, here we can say affinity A yeah, with this index. And that means this task, yeah, or we advise the runtime to execute this task as possible as close to actually where variable A resides in memory. That means, and I come back to the overhead in a second, that means that the runtime has to figure out yeah, where is A with a certain index. That means where is this page being located? Where is the thread actually, or this, uh, yeah, where are the threads located? That means it has to solve an optimization problem to some extent. And uh, I'm saying it uh, in this non-technical term to actually make you think about that this feature comes does not come for free. So use it wisely because it comes with uh, some overhead. Yeah? But if uh, you know how the data is laid out on a NUMA system, possibly some blocks, how you create the, uh, you, how you want to execute the task, you can instruct the runtime to do so and get better performance uh, or hopefully better performance. Uh, question? Yes. Okay, so why not B or C? Why A? So, um, yeah, I, I was very uh, short on that. So the assumption here is that initialization and computation have the same blocking and same affinity. So I didn't say that explicitly, but the assumption is that A, B, and C are blocked in a same way over the NUMA node. So A0 and B0 and C0 are on the same NUMA node. If they would reside on a different NUMA node, yeah, then you could specify both. For example, mm -hmm. and then the runtime has to decide. Yeah, so does but, that mean that you could use either of them, like yes. D, C, yeah, you could a, use, yes, exactly, and, yeah. and any of them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, remember, you. if you put multiple variables at the end of the day, a task can be executed by a thread only on a single core. Yeah. 
So if you have conflicting goals, yeah, don't expect any magic here. That's, that's important. <laughs> right. Okay, thank you. So again, let me illustrate yeah, what's behind it. Again, to underline, this does not come for free. So what happens, yeah, and this is from an older paper considering the LLVM implementation, what happens if a task region is encountered? If there's no data affinity clause, yeah, then the task will be pushed to the local queue. What does that mean? In uh, the LLVM open and P runtime, there's one task pool or task queue per thread. Uh, that has uh, certain advantages. So uh, you can add tasks or push tasks uh, with very little, um, what's the English word? Let's say with very little conflict, very little um, synchronization. And you can also steal from the queue from the back, uh, again, with very little synchronization. I'm, I'm missing the English word here. So this is very cheap. Uh, we talked about that and maybe we even showed some uh, measurements of the small overhead when we introduced the tasking feature. What happens if there is an affinity clause? Yeah? Only then uh, the mechanism behind that is being enabled. So the runtime will see does this location yeah, of the data reference, like A with a certain index on the example on the previous slide, is in a map. That means a helper data structure. If yes, yeah, it will put the task not into the local queue, but in, let's say, a remote queue. Uh, so that means into the queue of one of the threads um, that's closest to the data. So it has to have some notion of the topology of the system and where threads are being executed. And that also implies that you use some kind of thread binding. Yeah? So this is a little bit of overhead, but this means that uh, uh, if all threads are utilized, yeah, this thread will be executed by, uh, sorry, this task, sorry, will be executed by one of the threads that's close to the data that has been specified. However, when a certain reference is used for the first time, yeah, it's not in the map. So that means the OpenMP runtime has to identify which page this data belongs to, on which NUMA domain this is being stored, and then select the particular thread. Again, find out where it's running, save this reference in the map. Yeah? So that comes with some overhead. In particular, here the operating system is being involved um, on the depending on the configuration or implementation, maybe even a context switch. In human times, this is quick. In computer times, this takes really long. Yeah. So there's a paper from uh, IWAM 2018, uh, actually uh, outlining the concept, providing some measurement data, and explaining what's happening behind the scenes. Why am I going into detail here? So I don't pro um, propose to you to use affinity clauses whenever yeah, you're using tasking. So this is a solution only if you know that your task parallel program uh, depends on a, a good mapping in order to achieve good performance. So that means if you see high variation uh, in performance or even better if you did the performance analysis and understand that the number of removed memory accesses is higher than ne necessary. Yeah, so um, what uh, can we achieve? This is from a sorting algorithm. Yeah, so there are good examples. These are uh, uh, measurements taken uh, from a paper. On here, we see a significant speed up. Yeah, sorting again is also sensitive in order to memory placement. Uh, obviously, this is an um, example that we selected in the paper uh, that is sensitive. Uh, there are other codes that are not sensitive, uh, of course. And also for individual tasks, yeah, the affinity um, feature can significantly reduce the um, variation of individual task execution times. Yeah, there are still outliers. That's fine because of task tealing. Toward the end of uh, this was a recursive merge sort, I guess, maybe even a quick sort, but I leave a merge sort. Towards the end, yeah, if a thread has already finished its uh, amount of work it wants to grab, meaning steal a task remotely, and that takes longer then because remote data has to be accessed, but it's worth it over keeping individual threads uh, idle. Yeah? But uh, we were able to significantly improve performance and uh, in particular by decreasing uh, the task execution time variation in between the threads. And this is then uh, verified with uh, a performance 
a hardware performance counter a measurement tool. So the overall performance improvement of the program uh, stems from removing or uh, reducing the amount of remote memory accesses. Yeah? That means uh, the local memory is used more frequently and that provides higher bandwidth and then in total also fewer traffic on the intercom. So to summarize it, yeah, if you see a task parallel program with high variation in runtime, um, yeah, ask your performance expert or engineer to do a performance measurement, take a look at NUMA um, memory access behavior, in particular if you're using threads over multiple NUMA nodes, of course, and uh, then enable thread affinity. If uh, uh, you still see those things, then consider this uh, feature. Yeah, that means the affinity clause helps yeah, if tasks access data heavily. Um, in particular, if we have a, what I like to call a single task creator scenario, that means one or very few threads creating all the tasks, whereas other threads then particularly uh, execute those tasks. So that means uh, this might not match the parallel access pattern from the um, initialization. Uh -huh. And also if you have a light, high load imbalance among the tasks, this could be an indication. Yeah? And do not, finally, do not forget that task stealing continues to be allowed. Good, that's all what I prepared on this topic. Other questions? See something in the chat? Oops. Ah, contention. Yes, I was, yeah, I was missing that word. Thank you very much, Michael. Happy to help. All right. Okay. Are there any questions? While I'm switching slides. No new questions. All right. So uh, this is a topic uh, and now for something completely different, I guess. Uh, so this is one of the GPU topics. Um, so Christian was talking about um, Jacoby um, at the beginning of the session. Uh, and I just want to give you another perspective on this using some pretty darn old Fortran code uh, called NWChem. Uh, in this case, it's the Tensor Contraction Engine, or TCE for short, um, and a specific chemical or quantum chemistry computation called CCSD in parentheses T, which is short for coupled cluster with single, double, and perturbative uh, triple replacements. If that makes any sense to you, Fair enough, I asked that simple question, what that all means, and I got a three hour quantum chemistry lecture, um, and I'll, I'll still have a hard time remembering what is what it, this is exactly. But this is something I was working on. Um, let me say that the way I'm doing this is not the ideal one. There's another formulation of this uh, using DGEM operations, uh, where you um, basically use the tensors and map them to regular matrix multiplies. Um, or you can use a tensor library, of course, um, to also express those. But this it's it's rather illustrative on how OpenMP can work in Fortran on a um, on a GPU. All right. So NWChem, if you don't know it, it's a quantum com uh, computational chemistry software package for quantum chemistry and molecular dynamics. And the cool thing about NWChem is you can actually switch back and forth between the two uh, things and you can do quantum chemistry together with molecular dynamics uh, in that way. Uh, it is designed for large scale supercomputing uh, computers. Um, so I think we ran it on, uh, they ran it on pretty much every supercomputer um, on this planet and we're, we're able to use pretty much uh, the full machine. It's done at Pacific Northwest National Lab at the um, Environmental Molecular Sciences Laboratory. And if you're interested in, I think the URL by now is outdated. So look for it. it they now have a GitHub um, hosted web page, I think. All right. So first step is to find offload candidates. So for the Jacobi, we, I think we pretty much gave you indications on where things have to happen. Um, but you know, if you if you have to do this yourself, the first thing you got to do is look for regions uh, in your code that are con uh, compute intensive. So that's the first property they um, are supposed to have. Then, of course, they should be highly parallel to may actually make use of your like um, um, a massively parallel um, architecture like uh, GPUs. And then, ideally. 
uh, the compute should be scaling uh, stronger than the data transfer. So that means that compute should be something like O of N3 versus the data size being N squared. So, you know, prime example, DGEM, um, if you have square matrices, they are N squared in size, but then the computation that you do uh, increases cubic in terms of the matrix size. So these are the are potential offload candidates. And NWCAM actually has 27 of those in this particular formulation um, of the couple cluster method in TCE. And so, you know, these are these sort of loops. Um, so many of them are, are pretty much having a very similar, not even uh, potentially the same structure. Uh, most of them are seven perfectly nested loops. So in this case, it's actually six, but that's just because I already kind of you know, collapse the inner one manually. So in this case, you can still see the trace that this is an H2, H3 loop. Originally, that was a nest of seven uh, nested loops. Three of them have a P index. Four of the, uh, three of them, or four of them in this case, have um, a, um, um, a, an H index. And then this is a pretty much, you know, um, operation like, uh, give me a second. Sorry. Um, so this is pretty much, you know, um, sort of, as you can see, some sort of a DCHM operation with multiplication and addition, in this case, with a prefactor of minus one. So then uh, the trip count is uh, equal to what NWCAM calls a tile size. This is 10 to 20, uh, 20 to 30 in production. So all of these loops run from one to 20 or up to 30, um, you can you can choose the tile size to adjust the, the level of parallelism in those loops, but also you know to adjust those loops to things like cache sizes and so forth. Um, so if you if you think about this, you know this loop nest is pretty much uh, 20 to the power of seven iterations. So this is nicely parallel um, in in this in this particular case. So we can use this basically say something like, you know, off, offload those loops, target teams distribute parallel do, you've seen this um, to some extent, then privatize everything. And then also potentially, you know, in the end, collapse those loops so that you get, you can exploit this 10 to the power of, um, or 20 to the power of whatever, uh, six in this case, uh, loop iterations um, to parallelize. And I already added this thing up here where the compiler, if you remember the introduction to the GPU prog programming, that there is a presence check. If you don't do map clauses, the compiler adds a presence check, which can either be then a map clause if needed, or if the data is already present, it basically ignores um, that, that mapping. Now, if you do a naive data allocation. So either by doing the implicit map clauses or in presence checks by the compiler or adding explicit map clauses, what you'll find is that the triple SX array, this is, uh, you know, to the power of six of the tile size. So for a tile size of 24, the triple SX array consumes about 1.5 gigabytes. Um, and the T2 and V2 arrays, they both consume like two and a half megabytes. And so what would happen is if you run this like naively, up here, we would transfer 1.5 gigabytes of data over to the GPU. We run for a couple of milliseconds. And then down here, we're gonna transfer like 1.5 gigabytes back. Now, the cool thing is, this is embedded in a larger structure. So what happens is in an outer loop where we iterate all over all the tiles that are available to the system for processing and that basically describe the quantum state of the of the problem that is being computed right now. Um, what you can see is that the triple SX array is actually something like an accumulator. So what we can do is we can use target ender data map alloc to basically simply alloc the triple SX array with 1.5 gigabytes once on the GPU. Then we call a zero kernel you may remember that from, from our previous slides. Then there's potentially some interaction with other compute nodes in the system. 
And then we basically only have to transfer the five megabytes, 2.5 megabytes each for the T2 and V2 array. And then we can call a whole sequence of those kernels that, in, that involve T2, V2 to accumulate into the triple SX array that we allocated once. And then, you know, for the, for the other, this is like, uh, I think the first um, nine kernels, and then there's like another nine, and then there's another source file where there's another nine kernel to match the 27 I was, I was saying. All right, and then, you know, once this, all this is done, at the end, you basically then run um, a sum energy, that's a horizontal um, aggregation across the triple SX array to produce the final energy um, of that system. And then in the end, once you're done with, with all the tiles and everything that you have to do, you basically can release the 1.5 gigabytes um, in the end. And so what happens is we allocate that once, it stays on the device for the whole computation, we keep it, we reuse it all the time for all the tiles, um, we basically zero it out again. We do the computation that we need for those tiles. We do the sum energy for those tiles. And in the end, when we're completely done, we release the data to from the GPU and release all the data environments that we have there. All right, and then inside those kernels, again, you know, this is where the presence checks come in. So since triple SX has been allocated up here, it's gonna not, it's not gonna be retransferred. And due to the target data, um, environment up here with T2 and V2 sub. Um, we also don't have to transfer the data again down here. It's done once here. And then all the kernels that are running here in sequence will basically pick up the same data uh, that we uploaded um, once. And I think this is nice to illustrate that you uh, can very flexibly combine um, target directives, target data directives, and ender and exit data directives, and you can stick them together uh, in whatever way uh, you need for your algorithm to work on your GPU. Uh, question? Yes, please. So it, is this uh, subroutine in a different file or the same file? It doesn't matter actually. Um, this is actually in different files. So this is in like in a, you know the TCE driver file and then all the kernels are in a separate uh, translation unit. And by the you know pointers that are being passed in here, the OpenMP runtime can figure out that you know whatever is being used in here, regardless mm -hmm. of the name, is actually um, what has been allocated up here. Okay, but are you saying that even if that code was in the same file, you need the presence? Uh, yes. Target. Yes. It's necessary, right? Okay. Thank you. All right, Christian, back to you. Okay, other questions? While I'm working this. Not no. in the chat, not on Slack. With Jacoby's exercise that uh, Christian showed earlier uh, at the beginning actually is a uh, simplified, I think simplified small small code that you can use a reference and all the functions can be in different uh, different files. In that unstructured uh, in, in the directory there, you see two files actually. One is the main code, one is the all the subroutine, all, all the functions. There's also a Fortran uh, directory there. So you see uh, subroutines. You can enter data map in one subroutine and then exit in another. Okay, then let me come to the closing topic of today and maybe the whole uh, webinar. And this is um, Michael already actually touched upon hybrid programming um, in the last session. So MPI and uh, uh, OpenMP and HIP was what he was explaining how to combine and now i'm going to talk about mpi and openmp yeah, which i would say is a, um, the standard uh, combination of paradigms in supercomputing or high performance computing because we need mpi to program for the cluster openmp for efficiency on the node and possibly also uh, accelerators oops but that's not
वर्क नहीं आ रही है तो दिस इज नॉट द स्लाइड आई वांटेड टू शो व्हाई इज नॉट द मोटिवेशन कमिंग सॉरी समथिंग इज रॉन्ग हियर ओके या इज फाइन लेट मी रीस्टार्ट फ्रॉम हियर Okay, I was missing the motivation, which is not good to start with. So what what's happening in recent years? Yeah, is oops, I know formatting went a little bit wrong here. Um, we have seen, in, uh, depending on how far you look back, an explosion of parallelism. First, we got many more nodes in the clusters, yeah, from hundreds to thousands and ten thousand and so forth. But then we also got many more. cores in the cluster yeah from 2 4 eight cores per node uh, processor i'm sorry uh, to nowadays um, over 100 in a processor so we have hundreds of cores in a node and thousands to 10000 of nodes in uh, the cluster and we might even have uh, accelerators one two or maybe four or eight in an individual node so it's clear if you want to program for a cluster we have to use something that uh, goes beyond shared memory that means we use typically mpi for message passing it's a distributed memory program model uh, i guess uh, you you know about that and uh, then we use openmp to program for those multiple cores possibly manage the heterogeneous memory in particular as we learned today exploit those simd uh, features in modern cores and so forth and use something like CUDA or HIT or OpenMP to program for your uh, accelerator, in particular GPU. That means we have to combine multiple programming models. And of course, there are challenges, but there are also advantages. And when we introduced OpenMP, we said uh, one of the strengths of OpenMP is to actually uh, have a clear semantic if you combine multiple features. Michael talked about interacting OpenMP with your uh, GPU program model of choice. And now I'll add, I think, three or four slides on uh, defining what's important when combining OpenMP with MPI. But uh, I would like to add one, uh, let's say, thought to the motivation. So I said it's necessary to use all those program models, but it can also improve efficiency. So there are a couple of publications on uh, in the literature, and uh, we did similar studies, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, in favor of the argumentation that if you uh, consider OpenMP to use within the node, then MPI uh, over OpenMP alone, you can improve efficiency because at every level uh, of your parallelization, yeah, there's a certain limit to how far you can scale. Uh, unless you have, uh, let's say, a, a naive parallelism or trivial parallelism, uh, then you're uh, lucky. Yeah? Think of a domain decomposition and then a linear equation system. If you would do it all in MPI, yeah, uh, your scalability would uh, end much earlier. You would have to replicate more data structure, probably consume more memory than if you would go hybrid with MPI plus OpenMP. Uh, that means uh, exploit more cores uh, in OpenMP on the node level than with MPI. I hope this made sense as a motivation. Yeah, we could talk in detail for much longer about that, but we have seen many applications where we have, um, um, yeah, where it's beneficial to use multiple threads within the node than to do it in MPI alone. And that's why I believe most cycles on modern HPC systems are being consumed by those hybrid parallel programs. So what's the challenge in combining those? Um, well, OpenMP knows about threads and MPI only if you tell it to do so. So, you know, an MPI program has to be started with MPI in it that initializes the MPI library. And then there's also MP finalized to finally shut it down. And if you want to make use of threading in your OpenMP uh, in your MPI program or hybrid parallel program uh, using MPI underscore in it underscore thread, so the underscore thread is new, is really important because it will ask or initialize your MPI library with the requested uh, degree of parallelism. And you're responsible yeah, first to initialize it with thread safety and 
yeah, to select the right threading support model. If you fail with one or the other, yeah, the result is undefined. In the best case, all is good. In the worst case, your program fails, has uh, wrong results and so forth. So there are four different levels. Yeah? The default level, yeah, which you get if you do not ask for MPI init thread is MPI thread single, which assumes that there's only one thread yeah, in each MPI process. That means the MPI library does not have to, um, let's say, use any internal synchronization constructs. It can assume yeah, because you are sure to do to, uh, that this is the case, that there will be neither another thread making use any of the resources it shares with the main program, uh, and also never another thread making use any uh, of any call into the MPI library. Then there's MPI thread funneled. Yeah? That means only the main thread or the initial thread in OpenMP may make uh, MPI calls, MPI thread serialized. Any thread may make use of the MPI library, but only one thread at a time. So that means synchronization is done in your application. Or MPI thread multiple, that means multiple threads may call MPI routines concurrently with no restrictions. That means synchronization duties are on MPI. And this is why you do not get this behavior with default, because MPI thread multiple may incur significant overhead inside the MPI implementation. I didn't bring any numbers. We did measurements over time. And actually, the overhead of MPI thread multiple yeah, normalized to the performance of the network or the system is going up and down. And it depends actually on which kind of network you're uh, measuring. Yeah? So there's um, there was OmniPass, there's InfiniBand, different generations of InfiniBand, different cards, different drivers. The one from Mellanox, uh, the OFED stack, I believe it's called, coming with Red Hat and uh, so forth. So there's no clear uh, statement, at least that I'm aware of, uh, that I could make yeah, that any of those, um, yeah, that, that what the overhead is for, let's say, um, a representative set of MPI libraries that come with different models. But there are overheads, and I hope uh, I explained it, uh, in particular with MPI thread multiple, the MPI library has to guard all its data structures and so forth, so that multiple threads may call MPI functions at any point in time. So I have a couple of um, illustrations here. Yeah? These are the um, MPI init and MPI analyze routines called, whoops, so my laser pointer, by two different processes. Yeah? Then we have the blue lines, MPI communication, and those red or orange lines that will come up on the next slides will illustrate thread synchronization. Yeah? So here, MPI thread single means there is only one thread per MPI ray. Yeah? And you're even violating that if you use a parallel region because the threading runtime might modify some, let's say, shared data structures or shared state um, within your process that is also being used by the MPI library. Yeah? And there are certain things that you can assume if you're guaranteed that there's no threading involved. So that means as soon as you're going to use OpenMP somewhere in your program, MPI thread single is not valid anymore. Yeah? It's really a very simple um, or yeah, very straightforward yeah, guarantee that there's no threading involved. Because many people believe MPI thread single is actually what MPI thread funneled is. Yeah? And this is not true. That's why I'm explaining it here. That means only one thread communicates. Yeah? So here we have now an OpenMP parallel region, yeah? but the blue box is attached to only uh, one thread at a point in time. Yeah? So that means, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, there's uh, only one selected thread. Yeah? Here it's the initial thread. It could be any other thread ID if you like, yeah? but it's always the same thread ID, meaning system thread ID, that's calling the MPI library. So why is it important? Well, if you make use of, um, I think we introduced OpenMP thread private. Uh, the general technique is called thread local storage, for example, where you use thread IDs to actually map private or thread private data and so forth 
Uh, you can again simplify your implementation, meaning less overhead, if you know that the library is always called with the same thread ID. Yeah? Again, this is a uh, guarantee that you as a programmer provide to the runtime, and if you violate it, yeah, the result, uh, if, it, if the program fails, is your uh, responsibility. Yeah? So you have to uh, fix it. Okay, now this is more interesting, MPI thread serialized. Yeah? This means only one thread communicates at a time, but thread ID might change from time, at time, but, uh, from time to time. So now we see those orange bars, yeah? and that means you have, or we as a programmer, so we have to synchronize. If thread zero calls MPI init and thread one, two calls MPI receives later, we have to make sure that init has been completed well, that's a simple example. Yeah, it, it says completed before we call MPI receive. I think this is uh, clearer here. Uh, let's make it an I receive. Yeah, so we have to ensure that this is being completed before another thread calls MPI send. Yeah, and then another thread may call the barrier and finally MPI finalize. That means here we are guaranteeing that only one thread at a time will be interacting with the MPI library. So it has to prepare itself that there are multiple threads with different IDs, but it has, doesn't have to lock or, make, uh, or ensure that correctness uh, with other mechanisms of its internal data structures, uh, because there will not be two MPI calls uh, happening at the same point in time. Uh, this is not possible if we have thread synchronization in between. And uh, this is then the final so, um, approach. So here we have, oh, sorry, the final mode, MPI thread multiple. All threads may communicate concurrently without any synchronization. Yeah? MPI init and finally finalize obviously uh, are separate, but here we can have multiple threads doing sends and receive uh, while other sends and receives are still ongoing. And I hope, yeah, I said it a couple of times to make it clear, this means any buffers, any progress counters and stuff like that now have to be really thread safe in order uh, to ensure that uh, no error happens. So which one is best? Well, the answer is, uh, as always, it depends, uh, or as always, if the question is uh, complex enough. Uh, so it depends on your application. Of course, this one yeah, comes with more overhead in the case of the individual send or receive. But if this provides better progress in your overall application, yeah, this is a preferable mode. So my recommendation is to use the uh, least demanding mode uh, from the MPI library that's um, applicable to the way you're using MPI in order to get the best result. Yeah? Just asking for more because um, yeah, that doesn't give you any performance uh, benefit, yeah? but expressing asynchronous uh, task parallelism in OpenMP, I, 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 I hope yeah, we convinced you of doing so, is beneficial. And if you then do MPI from OpenMP tasks, uh, MPI thread multiple is what you probably have to use. So much for hybrid programming with MPI and OpenMP. And to some extent, this also applies to other libraries uh, that you might use in your program. Uh, so string tokenizer in C is an example that's not really thread safe if you're using it with multiple threads and thread IDs at the same time. Uh, so when you're, you're uh, going to use uh, third party libraries, you have to read the documentation in how far they provide thread safety and what your requirements are regarding the implementation of synchronization. And I don't see a question in the chat, so I will hand back to Helen or Michael if he has to say something. Uh, no. No? Uh, <laughs> maybe, 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 uh, maybe yes, I, yes. I still have a comment, I'm sorry. I was, I, my, my note came out too quick before my brain actually said, yep. <laughs> um, all right, so there's there's one thing, uh, we don't have a mater material on this, but, um, if we do this kind of series again, we will have those slides. So one of the things that is a bit complicated still with all that 
um, Christian has presented is how do you actually exchange between two threads and send messages between two threads on a node? The problem that you still have despite all those threading levels is that MPI doesn't really have a mechanism to basically target like a thread within a process. There's a bunch of hacks that you can assume uh, that you can abuse to do to achieve that goal. Um, plus uh, MPI four, I believe, has introduced partition communication where you can set up, up a MPI buffer so that each open MP thread gets a partition of that buffer. And then each thread can individual se um, signal to the um, to the MPI library that this partition of that thread is ready, and then the, the MPI library can decide whether it delivers the partition or waits until all threads have flagged that all partitions are done. So there are ways how you can deal with the situation that you want to communicate from a fully multi-threaded context, but right now the situation is not ideal yet um, if you want to you know, exchange messages using MPI um, and if you have multiple threads running. Now I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the comment. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? If not, I think we are done for the series. Big applause. Yay. It was a yeah. pleasure. Thank you for the speakers and staying with us. Thank you for the audience as well. We, yeah, thank you for, for going through the whole series. I mean, many of you probably did, right? And, and so, yeah. so Helen is sending also survey links. We would appreciate your feedback. Yeah? Of course, we're lucky if we hear something was good, but if you have an idea on how to improve things, we also, uh, we ask for your honest feedback. Yeah? Yeah, please do the survey Great. and you can put um, the comments for the whole series in there. Um, and yes. Some of the questions asking you any, you know, anything we can do better and just put your, your thoughts there. And uh, the questions, if you still have uh, questions to ask, I think the Slack channel could be alive for maybe a week or so. Um, and it is the free Slack, so the previous message may have gone now. But yeah, if you think things are important, you know, you want to save, do it quickly. Exercise questions, keep asking in the Slack. I think it should be okay. A week or so. The training, uh, if you don't have a nurse account, we give you the training account access for another week. Yeah. So you should have received emails about those. Well, thanks again. You had a Great. wonderful time. Excellent series. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, your contributions. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you very much. Yeah. And, and the, all the videos are public, so it could be a, a good resources for the whole community. Hi, Helen. I have a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. It's, it's more on next steps. Um, having completed each of the series, um, the next steps uh, to follow up on this series. Um, I know SC24 is next month. Do you have any recommendations on sessions or tutorials or workshops to attend? Excellent question. Michael. Um, well, there's an, an OpenMP tutorial for GPUs at SC24. Um, I guess that's going to be interesting. Um, you'll, you'll see some of the content that we presented in different shape and form. And they will also present a bunch of things that, that we couldn't present in, in this series. Uh, then if you want to hear something fancy, there's um, a project that does OpenMP for Python. Um, they also have a tutorial. So if you're interested in what they do and if that could be applicable, um, then this is going to be an interesting one as well. Um, then if you are in Atlanta for SC24, uh, come to the booth. Uh, we have reference. The OpenMP booth. Have... I'm sorry? The OpenMP booth. Yes, come to the OpenMP booth. Yes. Um, we have flyers. We have beanies. Uh, all sorts of uh, ways you can show your open MP pride. Uh, plus we have reference cards uh, or reference guides that basically summarize the open MP syntax. Um, and then there's the open MP buff um, on Wednesday at supercomputing at 515. Don't ask me about the room number. 
Um, but that's also, you know, you can meet me, you can meet Christian uh, and a whole bunch of other um, members of the OpenMP ARB to discuss, uh, provide feedback, ask questions, and, well, simply have a good time with us. Yes, it's room B212 if you want to add oh, to your found. calendar. Yeah. Thank you. Michael is our um, OpenMP Architecture Review Board CEO. Organized all these events, mainly with with uh, lots of team behind, of course. Yeah, that's Thank why you. I have to advertise them. <laughs> <laughs> So that's a very timely question. Thank you. Okay, then. All right. We'll see you there, then. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. <laughs> Mike, right. have a nice evening. <laughs> a good evening. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, have a, a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.